Um, thank you all for joining us here at uh, 55 Tufton Street, the home of the Taxpayers Alliance, and we're pleased to welcome our friends for, from the Americans for Tax Reform Foundation to launch their Trade Barriers Index. And I think it's the third iteration of the Trade Barriers Index, started in 2019, and it evaluates countries on their use of the most direct barriers to trade, so tariffs, which of course are the tax in another name, non-tariff measures, services restrictions, as well as uh, each country's ability to facilitate trade. We're also going to have a bit of a focus today on a digital services tax, would be um, a welcome up. And um, the Trade Barrier Index is really a response to um, rising trade tensions across the world. Um, there was a growing need for a tool that ranked countries um, by these different metrics. And of course, when you rank countries by these metrics, you can then track over time whether they're doing better or still the same. So, We'll see how the UK fares um, post-Brexit. Um, I will crack on. I think without further ado, we're going to hand straight over to Philip Thompson, who's a policy analyst at the Americans for Tax Reform Foundation. He specialises in international intellectual property legislation and trade policy. Um, he's the author of the report. And before joining ATRF, uh, Philip worked at the American Legislative Exchange Council's Foreign Affairs Task Force and at the Cato Institute's Trade Policy Center, so is very well placed to talk about the issues at hand. So, Philip, straight over to you. Well, thank you so much, John. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, specifically, I wanted to know lunch here in the UK because um, the news because of Brexit, there's now less trade barriers between the UK and the rest of the world. So, the UK is actually the most improved, moved from eighth place to fourth place. And uh, I have a special award for you, I hope you can accept. Mm -hmm. On behalf of the whole uh, United Kingdom, this award was specifically chosen to be a reminder of how much more free trade needs to be done because these uh, special cake sprinkles from the United States <laughs> <laughs> are completely illegal and uh, because of a special red dye that the EU says uh, food coloring additives can only be used in uh, special uh, products that substantially uh, natural color that's already there, and uh, so they, it can only be used and not in sprinkles. So here you go. Legal product. <laughs> now uh, onto the index. So we have the. There we go. So uh, the freedom to trade that connects uh, individuals to trade their goods and services should be their own natural right, without uh, any interventions. Uh, but we find in the index that when countries uh, lower their trade barriers, that they have more uh, economic development, human development, uh, more competitive business environments. Uh, countries with more trade barriers <coughs> tend to be more corrupt. They have more illicit trade. Uh, they have slower internet connections. Uh, they have more abuse of the press. So removing trade barriers in its own way is, has its own uh, economic and social benefit. And index, we also launch uh, case studies, which you can find online that we do with um, free market think tanks from around the world that go more behind the data on how these uh, barriers hurt pe individuals. So we have uh, excellent case studies from Indonesia on the barriers for food imports and how that contributes to malnourishment. A uh, case study from Sri Lanka on the trade barriers for construction material and how that uh, relates to shortage of uh, housing. A case study from Philippines on taxes on tobacco, how that contributes to smuggling. A uh, case study from Brazil on how trade barriers in the Mercosur region divert uh, the auto supply chain, uh, and so many more. So I hope you can go to the website and you'll be able to read about the case studies. This is the structure of the index. So we look at the three most direct forms of uh, trade barriers. So those are non-tariff measures, which um, are those rules on sprinkles, the rules on the chlorinated chicken. Uh, we have tariffs, which we know are taxes on imports, and then uh, services restrictions. Those are more businessy uh, barriers. And then we have a facilitation portion, which looks at the behind-the-border measures that allow trade to happen. So things like property rights, logistics performance, membership and trade agreements. And we also have a, a measure for digital restrictions, which was the only real change from the 2019 version. Uh, to this version, we changed the methodology, so we did it uh, in-house. The other uh, indicators, it's a composite index, come from the World Bank or the UN or the WTO. 
And they're all uh, equally weighted between each other. And this is the so this is the top 15 changes and the top 15. So Singapore is still number one. Uh, that meant uh, Hong, Hong Kong dropped down, obviously. Uh, New Zealand and Netherlands moved up one because of that. And then the UK has more fundamental changes in its own tariff schedule, which allowed it to move from uh, eighth, excuse me, eighth to fourth. And this is uh, all the countries together. So we also added, we went from 86 countries to 90 countries, which played a role in how some changed. Uh, in last place, we have India. Uh, Green country here is the Western Europe, which is the UK and the EU and Switzerland. And then I have in the middle there is the United States. It's 52nd this year. And the third to last is uh, China. It's kind of purple if you can see it. So China was uh, second to last uh, in 2019, and now it's third to last because in its uh, response to the US uh, trade war, China actually lowered its MFN tariff rate, uh, which is uh, not very common, and moved it up enough to be uh, Algeria. This is what it looks like uh, by region, and I've pulled UK out of Western Europe, so you can see its average score between the indicators is below average, uh, lower trade barriers than the rest of Europe now. Um, as you look at the regions, you can see that red line is the facilitation score, so as you go through emerging market, developing countries, it's that facilitation which uh, stands out, and as you go to uh, Western Europe, North America, um, or services and uh, tariffs that go down with development. Here is the uh, tariff barriers by region. So we have three indicators. It's the non-tariff measure, the MFN tariff rate, the duty-free, percent of lines that are duty-free, and the, um, the total number of tariff lines. So we know in the UK's new tariff schedule, there, is, uh, there might be a, a smaller MFN rate, and there might be less tariff lines in the six-digit category. We're not sure exactly, so we just kept those the same. But we do know that there's 60% of lines are now duty-free compared to the EU, where it's only 28% of lines are duty-free. And that's even uh, higher than the US rate, which is uh, 36, 46%. So that's quite a bit improvement. Uh, so non-tariff measures. So this is a kind of success in itself. It's a very gray zone because some countries, like some regions like Western Europe, has fewer non-tariff measures, but they apply to a much larger range of products. Uh, the United States and China actually have the most non-tariff measures, but uh, in the United States, they m apply more to individual products. So we have like some specific ones for lettuce, a lot for like tobacco. Uh, they tend to be more on agricultural products. Um, so if there's uh, salmonella on something, it's easier for the government to step in and say, we're going to get that. <clears throat> Before we talked about sprinkles, the uh, hot topic used to be chlorinated chicken. So in the index, there's seven main categories of non-tariff measures, um, like uh, quantity controls, price controls, uh, technical barriers. Uh, chlorinated chicken falls into cytosanitary controls. And each one of those has its subcategories. So these are the, uh, all the non-tariff measures that apply to prepared poultry. And you can see there's a couple different categories. It's only uh, the European Union has two that fall into hygiene. And it's only one of those, which is the farm to fork strategy, which is a precautionary measure that says uh, if chicken's been cleaned with chlorine, it's not that it's less safe, but there's this uh, supposition that the life of the chicken had a lower welfare, and that's not something the European Union wants to incentivize. So uh, they just have this rule, if it's been cleaned with chlorine, it can't be imported. So that small rule blocks out this huge uh, competitive industry there, which would probably um, uh, be quite competitive with the European Union. With sprinkles, the UK is import importing more food additive colorings from uh, Germany and the Netherlands than the United States, which would probably a lot more sprinkles. Uh, here we have uh, services restrictions. Uh, in the index, you can also see in individual countries how these apply to individual industries. And uh, so here I have the telecom restrictions and mode three services. Those are the restrictions on, uh, 
on how a foreign subsidiary can set up shop in another country. Uh, in the U.S. trade war, you heard a lot about forced technology transfer to China, which are how it was described as this behind the back door uh, rules between the Communist Party. If another company wants to go to China, it always ended up you had to have a Chinese partner. And this is what we were complaining about, these forced technology transfers. And uh, India, which is last place in this category, a lot of those rules are just written down on paper. If you are uh, uh, in certain industries, you have to have a certain number of foreign nationals on your board. You have to, you're limited on how much foreign ownership you can have. Uh, so that's the type of foreign uh, services we're talking about. Then we have uh, facilitation. <coughs> so you can see what the U Western Europe here is in the, in the lead. What it doesn't have to worry about is the number of trade agreements. Uh, and congratulations with the UK announcing a new trade agreement. It's almost every week now. And now it's with uh, New Zealand. It's a very forward-looking uh, agreement. And the UK is going into uh, TPP. Uh, so it doesn't have to worry about, about that. Uh, I think there's 31 trade agreements that we're counting with the UK uh, in the index. Um, the new thing here is the digital trade restrictions. So a huge number of uh, digital trade restrictions popping up. We have a case study on that. Andres will talk about. Um, <coughs> here is uh, how we, we, we made a new kind of index to measure digital trade restrictions. Uh, we've created uh, seven main categories. So those are uh, content localization. That's when uh, platforms like Netflix are required to have a certain percentage of shows uh, from Germany in Germany on their platform. Uh, content moderation, we saw a huge number of these in the last couple of years, uh, requiring platforms to flag uh, misinformation, sometimes to correct misinformation, uh, and, and that allow political censorship. Uh, in India this year, Twitter and other platforms had to block criticism of uh, COVID response. And that used to be something, YouTube and stuff used to be on Time Magazine, there was the democratization of internet. And now it's quite common to see a political censorship on the uh, platform. Now we have uh, data flow restrictions. Those are going to be uh, net neutrality regulations, uh, GDPR. And I can't tell you how many websites I've tried to be on uh, since being here. And uh, they're completely blocked. Now we, and then there's uh, gig economy restrictions. Those are app-enabled uh, services that restrict how, how individuals can offer their services. Uh, we have onerous restrictions, so those are going to be for electronic components. There's international standards that they meet, but then certain countries say uh, when you import them, you have to do like a duplicative uh, testing at our own uh, government uh, warehouses and stuff that just adds to cost of uh, trade. And then we have security barriers, so these are going to be uh, requiring a backdoor encryption keys, requiring a certifications for cloud services to operate in the market, and stuff like that. And then we have uh, digital taxes. Those are digital ad taxes, digital service taxes, link taxes, uh, VATs, uh, special tariffs on ICT products. So those have also been uh, ballooning in, in the last couple of years. So here are um, the worst six performers in the digital category. You have China, Indonesia, India, those are the kind of usual suspects for all types of trade barriers. And then, but that's followed by France, Germany, and Spain. So we're trying, we're starting to see kind of uh, two different models for digital trade. From Western Europe, you see more of a, a data flow restrictions, um, GDPR, DSA, and DMA that, that have um, special rules for platforms on content moderation. And from uh, China and East Asia, you see more of these cybersecurity regulations where it's more top-down uh, controlling of content mm -hmm. and uh, making sure that the government uh, has access to different types of data. Uh, so if you're a fan of free trade, this should be quite alarming because there's a huge share of uh, every country's GDP, the world economy is on e-commerce, a uh, huge share of data is on social media platforms, and the same rules that apply to like goods and services, like most of the nation's uh, principles, are not applying to e-commerce and digital trade in practice. 
So that's the uh, trade bear index, and thank you so much, John. Look forward to your questions. Thank you, Philip, um, and thank you for introducing the report and talking through it in such detail. Um, just for people in the room, in case you thought these microphones were merely decorative, um, we are actually live streaming, so um, we'd just offer a welcome to everybody um, around the world, a good afternoon, good morning, or indeed a good evening, wherever you are. Um, I mentioned that Andreas was going to speak about the digital services tax, so um, without further ado, Andreas, if you want to take that away. Thank you, John. Thank you so much for putting this together today. Uh, thank you, all of you, for coming today and, and your interest um, in this topic. Um, I want to <coughs> mention a new barrier to trade, um, the digital services taxes. So for those of you who don't follow this topic and who don't know, uh, in March 2018, uh, this digital services tax, uh, the concept of, of this tax was invented by the European Union. Um, they had the idea and the, and the feeling that there are many digital companies, mainly American tech companies, um, that operate in the European Union, um, and they claim that they wouldn't pay their fair share, um, but they would use all the infrastructure and have their customer base um, in, the, in the European Union. And so they um, figured, why not tax uh, the revenue of those companies um, and generate um, revenue for the European Union that they can then redistribute to the member states based on uh, user levels um, in those member states. And there's a second reason why they desperately were looking for a new way to tax um, other businesses, because the, this would be the first tax that the European Union really uh, has for itself. Uh, usually it relies on contributions from the member states, and they don't really have their own source of revenue. So this idea that they could um, impose their own tax and have revenue for their budgets and, and, and they can do whatever they want with it gives them a lot more power um, than, than what they currently have. So this is also part of the reason um, they started um, th thinking about implementing this tax. Um, it, it was supposed to be a 3% tax. Um, there were different um, uh, things that a company had to fulfill. It had to have a threshold of 7 million uh, euro in annual revenue in, in any of the member states. Um, it had to have at least 100,000 users in any member state um, in a taxable year. Um, and it would basically eliminate, this tax would eliminate um, two long-standing um, standards in international taxation. One is um, the physical presence requirement, and the other one is the principle of value creation. So the physical presence requirement is basically saying uh, the company gets taxed wherever it's headquartered. So if you're BMW and you're based in Munich in Germany, uh, you can sell your cars wherever you want, but at the end of the day, the German government uh, gets the, the, the tax revenue from, uh, from that company. And that's been fair and worked pretty well all over the world. And there was competition, of course, where companies would resettle if there was a lower corporate tax rate, for example. But there were a variety of reasons why companies wouldn't move uh, if it's infrastructure or um, they needed certain workers in that country that they would provide. Um, so it's, it makes sense to keep, uh, to stick to this uh, principle. The second principle that this would uh, effectively eliminate is the principle of value creation. And so the European Union would reverse this principle and claim that um, the value is not being created in, let's say, San Francisco, where one of those companies is headquartered when they invent new products and apps and services. The value is being created by the person anywhere in the world, but in this case, the European Union, where this person uses the service. So if you're using Tinder in Germany, then you're creating value by using that app, and, and not, the value is not being created by um, the company where it's headquartered, where the engineers are designing these services. Um, just to give one more example and, and to show how, how weird this all is, is uh, I think you would all agree with me that if you uh, talk about value creation and you talk about a French winemaker, uh, the, the long years of knowledge that they put into making this wine and making it a better wine than probably other wines that you can buy in the, in the grocery store, this is where the value is being created in, in, in France with this French winemaker not when you're sitting on your couch drinking or consuming it with your friends. Um, and so this adds a huge amount of danger um, as a trade barrier um, because it might work long, uh, short term now for the European Union or some of the member states that try to implement those taxes or actually implemented them. But if you think a step ahead, um, if we give up on those two principles, uh, there's, there's no reason why China couldn't, or other countries like India, could then say, well, if we, were, if we you know, don't have to buy by those principles anymore, uh, we now tax uh, everyone who drives a German car in China because the, the value is being created when you drive the car on the road and not um, when, it, when it's being uh, developed and manufactured. So this uh, proposal was um, rejected uh, thanks to low-tax countries like, like Ireland, Luxembourg, and Malta. They 
they're also host to some of the European subsidies in the European Union, so it never uh, reached a majority and it could never be passed. But the, the idea that you could tax other people that can't vote you out of office was, was really popular among European nations. It's like the politician's dream, right? You, you get tax revenue and, and the person you're taxing, you know, they can't do anything against you. They can't, they can't you know, vote you out of office uh, or make sure that this tax is not um, imposed anymore. So then France and many other countries um, implemented those digital services taxes and started collecting it. And that brings me to another point, and that is that at the end of the day, people pay taxes and not businesses. And then what you see is that, in Amaz that France and Amazon, uh, that Amazon in France um, and eBay in France, they just raise their user fees um, to the amount that covers the extra cost for, for this tax. At the end of the day, consumers would pay this tax. And another problem, and this is why it's a trade problem, is that of course, the United States government uh, at the time under the Trump administration, um, they launched um, Section 301 investigations um, at the USTR um, to find out if those taxes are discriminatory. Uh, and they um, completed all their investigations and found that all the taxes that are being implemented and the proposals that are not yet implemented are discriminatory uh, against American tech companies. And they recommended um, um, retaliatory um, measures um, that were not put in place yet, but it's still something that shows you the scope of this. If you start with these little petty taxes to get a certain amount of revenue that is not actually very, very valuable, but you, you do something out of principle like the European Union or France, it could trigger a, a lot more consequences overall uh, in, the, in terms of relationship, in terms of trade, but also in terms of usage. If you look at what happened in Australia with their news uh, bargaining uh, code that they tried to implement, um, Facebook and others, um, you know, effectively said, well, if, if this doesn't work for us anymore, we pull our services out of the country. And you would have similar restrictions and similar things that could happen in, in many European countries if companies decide this is not worth for it anymore. And then the, you know, uh, user in that country has a very different user experience um, than in other countries. Um, the last point I would like to make is that because of uh, those many unilateral measures that came out, um, the OECD decided you know, we'll, we'll try to put together a plan how we can effectively um, come up with a solution to this new digital taxation problem in the world. And um, they came out with a proposal um, that consisted of two pillars, pillar one and two. Pillar one basically reallocates taxation rights um, within countries, and pillar two is implementation of a global minimum tax. And um, the uh, more than 130 countries have now agreed to this scope of new ideas. Um, even though there's a variety of exceptions for, for many countries, and we don't even know if it's implemented in the U.S. right now because Congress and Senate are, you know, there's many very different views on this, if we should actually do this or not, if it's good for the U.S. And there's countries like Estonia and Ireland and Hungary who really not so much care about the implications of this policy, but about the overall um, problem that would create in terms of their financial um, sovereignty. Um, so now we have this agreement, um, and even though we have it, there's no effort by countries that implemented a digital services tax to end those taxes because we have this agreement now. So we might end up having a OECD Pillar 1 and 2 agreement plus the measures that we see from those countries on top of that. And all of this together, and that's the, the big case I would like to make today, uh, this together puts us in a, in a really bad spot in terms of competitiveness with China and, and, and countries like India. And so we, we should think about this as a you know, community of the Western community, do we really want to keep fighting about those small measures and, and self-restrict our, our competition, our levels of competition with a minimum, global minimum tax, for example, or in Pillar 1, the, the taxation rights, um, or should we rather work together and find a solution how we become more innovative, more competitive um, with lower uh, te taxes and, and trade barriers? Thank you. Thank you very much, Andreas. I should have said before Andreas started speaking, um, he's the International Ad Advocacy Manager at the Americans for Tax Reform Foundation. So we've had the, the view from DC there. And um, I'll now pass over to Victoria Hewson, who is um, the Institute of Economic Affairs' Head of Regulatory Affairs. She is a lawyer and practiced for 12 years in the fields of technology and financial services before joining the Legatum Institute's Special Trade Commission to focus on trade and regulatory policy. So again, um, another expert in the field. Over to you, Victoria. Thanks very much, John. 
And first of all, as well, thank you to Philip and um, congratulations on, on this publication. I really like these kinds of indices and reports, and this is a great, it is a really great one because it gives an overview pulling together the trends from all of the individual stories that I guess we follow day to day. Um, and, and it also gives insights into regions that perhaps, um, you know, we're not all following as closely. I'm delighted to see the UK going up the rankings. Uh, it's fair to say we perhaps haven't been as forthcoming in some of the um, Brexit opportunities as many of us might have liked to have seen so far, but I think one positive move has been our external MFN tariff schedule. It was broadly liberalising, um, cut out a lot of items from being subject to tariffs at all, which is reflected in the index, which is great. But even there, there's still a lot of room for improvement. There are still lots of tariff lines that we simply don't need. Well, I would say we don't need to apply tariffs to anything, but even from a, a more cautious political perspective, there are still lots of items there. I wrote uh, a contribution in the um, Free Market Forum's recent 30 for 2030 publication, making the case to get rid of at least tariffs on goods that the UK doesn't even produce, um, which unfortunately after consultation the, the government decided to retain for reasons to do with supporting producers in um, developing countries who, who essentially benefit from having zero tariffs as against competitor countries, richer countries, um, and the government didn't want to erode that preference. I think that's misplaced. And that's um, one area in our in our tariff schedule that we could certainly be improving upon without unleashing uh, all of these issues um, at perhaps local levels when we get into talking about ceramics or steel, which is uh, a, a, a debate for another day. On non-tariff barriers, I'm afraid, um, although in global terms perhaps we don't look too bad, I think the UK is still in danger of adopting the EU's worst barriers. Philip talked a bit about chicken, but we also have the EU's general ban on chilled meat imports, which we've not implemented so far. We've sort of put a unilateral grace period on that. Um, but that grace period is due to expire this autumn, and we will be banning the import of chilled meats from the EU simply because the EU bans the import of chilled meats from the UK. Now this is translated in the Northern Ireland Protocol into the sausage wars because obviously the implication of that for in the context of the Northern Ireland Protocol is that it will be illegal to sell British sausages and other chilled meat products to Northern Ireland. Um, and that's, you know, it, I, I guess the way that's been spun in the press is rather trivialising it, but it does illustrate the seriousness that, that these kinds of trade barriers do actually result in. Um, another one that's been in the news recently in services, we saw a relaxation was announced by the Department of Transport on cabotage restrictions, that is to say the ability of haulage companies from the EU to carry out local deliveries within Britain as opposed to simply drop off their delivery from the um, from the continent and go back on the ferry to France. Uh, obviously, we have a shortage of HGV drivers. The haulage companies seemed rather in favour of liberalising visas so they could get more, perhaps relatively low-paid workers into the company. They were less keen on opening themselves up to more competition from EU haulage companies. So I was really pleased to see, um, albeit currently on a temporary level, that, that those competitive restrictions have been lifted and hopefully that will actually turn into a permanent solution. Turning again back to Northern Ireland, obviously the Northern Ireland Protocol has resulted in some very serious trade barriers between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, which are perhaps not reflected in this index. Um, however, the approach set out by Lord Frost and his team in their command paper in July um, that would essentially create a dual regulatory zone in Northern Ireland, whereby products from UK, the UK authorised markets and the EU authorised providers would be able to freely circulate within Northern Ireland. Um, 
could be a tremendously liberalising solution, not just for Northern Ireland, mm -hmm. but if we were to replicate that for the whole of the United Kingdom, that would you know, be really great for liberalising trade and for competition, and ultimately, of course, good for consumers, which is what we want to see. Now, the most worrying sign, though, I would say, and, and Philip went into some uh, detail on that, is the increase in digital trade barriers in richer countries. The trends here are extremely worrying. The GDPR, the Digital Services Act, the Digital Markets Act in the EU, the UK's version of that um, coming from the Digital Markets Unit that's being set up within the CMA to basically tell digital platforms how to run their business um, and set up all of these codes of practice. And of course, the Online Safety Bill, which is seeking to regulate content. It seems to me that any gains that we might make from having strong digital chapters in free trade agreements, like with New Zealand or Australia or Japan, will be completely overrun if we pursue these kinds of measures. And actually, the whole usefulness of having digital and e-commerce chapters will be undermined if the UK and EU governments and others persist in their efforts to regulate the whole internet, even while at the same time pledging an international forum to reduce digital trade barriers. And here, I'm afraid to say, uh, the UK is, is heading in the wrong direction. The online safety bill we've just heard this week is going to be accelerated through Parliament with no opposition, which is always an absolutely terrible way to, uh, to pass legislation, as we can see from many instances in the past. And I think, just finally on the report, I think sometimes uh, in my darkest moments, I sort of feel rather despondent about measures like the online safety bill and think, well, you know, we're clearly losing a battle here. Is it really worth resisting? Perhaps we just need to recognise we've lost the internet as a, as a forum for free speech uh, and go back to writing good old paper pamphlets again. Um, but then I think, you know, publications like this remind us of just how important to prosperity free trade, including free trade in services and in digital networks is. And um, I think you know, that's a really helpful reminder to, to keep in mind, perhaps when we're considering writing off and, and giving up the fight that these things are actually really important uh, for all of us. Well, it's always darkest before the dawn, isn't it? <laughs> um, I, I was, yeah, I mean, that was an impromptu, you wrote that down, that, you began that, and you've written all of that down, and very much, like, you've been, what, you've been rehearsing for that your whole life. Um, and in many ways, you know, it's always darkest before the dawn, because it's like, that's how it begins, you know, this is how it's a cycle. We end up, we end up going back to this position where we feel like we're lost, and it's all ended, and it's all done, and, and actually, no, it's just the beginning, because endings are beginnings, and crisis is opportunity. Um, in Chinese, as it is, you know. And actually, I, this bizarrely was a word that I, I invented, um, which hasn't, about two weeks ago, a jai, um, because it's a moment that has all of that hope and fear and, and longing and what's been done and what's been missed and what could have been done. Um, and that actually was named after a guy called Hugo Guy, who was, I was having a chat to about depression. Um, and we asked Susie Dent whether this word existed in English, a word that meant both a beginning and an end. She does a countdown. And she said, um, no, it doesn't. Um, and it actually does. There is a word. It's crisis. Crisis is the ancient Greek word, which meant beginning and ending. But it has a lot of baggage to it, because it means, because it means chaos, actually. Because crisis upon crisis is chaos. And I don't know if you've noticed, but for a decade now, it has been nothing but chaos. Right? From the great financial crisis, every single one of us has, gone, has accepted chaos into our lives. And everything from that has meant that we are sit there not thinking of solutions, not thinking of how we can rise to a challenge, not thinking of how we can challenge ourselves and others, but accepting defeat. And so today, by the way, is Trafalgar Day. Because, and that is a really important moment. I just saw it from James Hallwood. If you follow James Hallwood, he's Alex Wilde's um, other half, who used to be of this parish. Um, and he has, a, you know, he, he gave the quote because he loves, he's a left wing guy who's become a right winger. Um, by virtue of meeting somebody from the TPA, and if that's not Matthew Elliott's spirit, then I don't know what is. Um, but he says that Britannia, triumph, um, her tri Britannia triumphant, her ships rule the seas, her watchword is justice, her password is peace. Well, I don't know if you can look around and see, but I don't see much justice in this world, and I don't see if we have let people pass who only say peace. 
I think that we have let a lot of people into the trade world that do not mean us peace, who do not mean us well. Um, and so the question is, what is it we are going to do about it? Are we going to accept that this graph is only going to get worse? Are we going to accept that it can only get more complex? Or are we going to go back to the fact that there is a lot in language and there is a lot in a word? And you know, you've called it TBI, but frankly, this is the this is the like this this is all of these complexities of trade, the very serious commentators that like narrow it down. It's effectively just somebody shouting no. And the question is, when I say that, are you seeing the triumph, the, the defiant teenager to her mother saying no, or are you seeing the stroppy teenager to her mother saying no? Um, and the question is, like, which one are you wanting to win? Is it the triumphant teenager who finally gets it right and actually you know, becomes, a, becomes an adult? Or is it the, ch the, teen the child that walks away failing um, and having to go again another day? Um, and that, that's a really important moment, because if you can see that this is, just another, this is just the time that we can actually turn this ship around and start to think about how we can cut these taxes, because right now there's a Eurasia group, going, group meeting going with Ian Bremer, where there's 400 people on, and we are much smaller than this group, um, but you are much more influential and much more powerful than you care to admit that you are to yourselves, um, because you have more access to the government of this day than he, he does from his days of Tony Blair. Um, although he's going to cop next month and he's going to get billions spent on your behalf, taken from your budgets, when you know that your budgets are quite constricted at the moment. You know that your personal finances are quite hard hit by this, by, by this crisis, and yet everyone's spending your money on your behalf, and at some point they're going to run out of it, aren't they? And if they have gone, and as they are doing, they are going, the world could be extinct by 2050, then they are telling you that you need to lower your horizons. And when they tell you that you need to lower your horizons, what they're saying to you is that somebody needs to pay the bill now, and you don't have enough money for the bill, collectively, because the whole point of capitalism is that it's built on credit, because the promise is that the next generation is going to have it better than this one, that you're going to build a better world. So are you going to build a better world? That's the challenge for you all. Are you going to rise to the challenge and set challenges for other people? And is it going to be better tomorrow than it is today? Matt, very enthusiastically jumping in with lots and lots of positivity there before I can even introduce you. You're the, the director of the Initiative for Free Trade, and you know if, you, if, you're, if you're leading that organisation with such enthusiasm, then more power to your elbow. Um, we've got plenty, a good bit of time for questions now, um, so if anybody in the room wants to raise a hand, put the appropriate question to the right member of the panel. Stephen. So I was interested in the different bar charts and all the lead tables that <coughs> how you want to describe them. Um, have you tried to bifurcate the movement in those upwards and downwards between like unilateral measures and um, multilateral measures where there's like a new trade agreement or where just a country is individually you know, announced on its uh, a standalone basis it's going to reduce some tariffs? I just wondered where the, where the weight was between those two. It's uh, extraordinarily difficult to put bar charts of all the non-tariff measures, but online on the country profiles, you can see the number of measures applied uh, bilaterally and the number of measures that apply to all countries. I haven't tried to do it with uh, considering in trade agreements. That would be considerably more difficult. Um, but that does lead me to something I'd left out, that a lot of these trade restrictions, especially non-tariff measures, uh, services restrictions. Uh, quite a few studies show that non-tariff measures are uh, more harmful than double the restrictiveness of tariffs. But uh, those are all usually and can be uh, liberated through domestic unilateral um, legislation or executive measures. And uh, so the UK doesn't need a trade agreement with the United States to get rid of it rule, it can just do that on its own. So um, I guess um, taking from Matt's point that there's brighter horizons ahead, that uh, a lot of the restrictions that are being experienced now, um, the UK has that destiny in its own hand. Uh, there is a small clause in the divorce agreement that if there is a change in the rule um, that causes material damage to the UK, to the the protected sprinkle industry in Europe, 
then uh, they can have a, a dispute around that and eventually the UK would be able to, the EU would be able to put uh, protective uh, or more tariffs on some UK stuff. And I think that's the, the best uh, way to start that fight is over uh, sprinkles to show how exactly how harassing these measures are um, uh, and, and the ridiculous some of these regulations really are. Thank you, Philip. I'm going to switch. Excellent piece by Philip and Capex that used our friends the sprinkles as a jumping off point yesterday that I recommend to you all. Dan. Thanks very much. Dan is from the EU Public Policy Centre and founder of uh, EUTariffs.com. Soon to be UKTariffs.com. Um, <laughs> the frontline cost of uh, import tariffs is quoted about three and a half billion in terms of the tax that's actually collected by HMRC. Now, whilst that's not actually that much, um, we've sort of seen now from being outside of the single market the barriers to entry Um, Victoria, why don't you... Yeah, so I'm not going to give you any numbers, but I think there are a couple of sort of um, points around the practicalities of that that I, I think relate to, to that point. Thinking, for example, yesterday I was at a, a quite detailed technical presentation about the way the customs arrangements between Great Britain and Northern Ireland are working. And in that presentation, some people in the audience were absolutely incredulous when they realised that if tariffs are due on trade from Great Britain to Northern Ireland, which can happen in certain niche circumstances, that the British government actually keeps those tariffs. We don't remit it on to the EU, even though they're making us do it. The declarations are made under EU customs rules. The UK HMRC would actually keep any tariff revenue. And that, to me, illustrates that those arrangements and the potential of levying tariffs on that trade is not about the revenue at all. It's about dissuading businesses from using that particular route and essentially preserving the, the, even the risk, preventing even the risk of those goods entering uh, Ireland and, and the single market. And I think, you know, you're right that the, the figure you gave, the three billion, is not a huge amount. And when you consider the costs associated with collection of that, it's astronomical uh, in, in the context of, of the revenue yielded. Um, again, to talk about the Northern Ireland situation, the British government, we, have paid tens of millions, if not now hundreds of millions of pounds, setting up the infrastructure for that to work. And if you, um, you know, e extrapolate that to the cost of, just the cost of the formalities, it's way out of proportion to the revenue raised. It shows really that this is not about raising revenue at all, it's about, it's about protectionism. Um, and, and obviously preferences as well. And so to a certain extent, and this is reflected in the report actually under the heading of facilitation, I think actually facilitation and non-tariff barriers um, are probably more important here than the revenue impact and the dissuasive impact of actually having to pay a tariff on the import. Um, and we know that because Oftentimes, if you do have a free trade agreement with preferences, um, sometimes importers will just pay the tariff because it's just too complicated to undergo the various, uh, the various customs procedures and claim your preference and uh, um, you know, make sure that you can meet the rules of origin, etc. So I think that's you know, something that the UK has sort of made some inroads in. I obviously don't have to tell you we've... we've um, you know, reduced our external rest of world facing tariffs. But I think we've got a way to go still on that facilitation side, the formalities. And there, I think we really could make some big differences that would really help consumers. So what was really interesting from last year, and actually you raised it in your talk, was the fact that last year we, st we stopped doing checks. Yeah. We didn't do checks on anything. We're, we're still not and, doing And checks. every single day we're not doing checks is proof yeah. 
don't that, that we don't need to do them yeah. in the first place. So all this complexity that we sit there with rest of rules, rules of origin, are they accumulative, are they horizontally or diagonally? It's like, no, no, stop. You don't need to do this. You don't need to meddle. You don't need to be involved in our lives so much. If something goes wrong, you've got a court. You've got recourse. You doesn't need to have this like constant devil down. Has it cost you something? And what's it cost you? That's the only thing that the courts need to have some justice mm -hmm. about. Um, and if you want to, to like, if you Google actually change your website from UK to EU, it's got to be UK versus EU because you need to set it as a thing so that it's a challenge that it goes down in terms of like you know people want it to get lower because and this is very strange. We've got tax and and you know we call a tariff a tax because it is a tax, right? Even though we then still call it a duty. Like duty's got a goodness attached to it. Don't do that. It's like it's a tax. It's a tax. Tax is bad. Um, and we sit there and say you know we wouldn't say non-tax barriers to, to jobs, but maybe we should. Um, because that's all that regulation is, isn't it? People think of regulation, they think maybe some, we need some rules to have them be good. And it's like, no, this is a barrier to jobs, a barrier to growth. Um, let's frame the terms of the debate um, and make it so that it's so that the left can't actually own this space anymore. They are, they are taxing our jobs and our growth and our dreams out of existence. Um, and stop taxing our dreams, guys. I saw Harry's hand shoot up. Harry. That's a whole uh, other event. We didn't really get into it, but uh, there's a lot of uh, questions that come in there on how WTO compliant those uh, carbon tariffs could be, especially if they're adjusted between different countries and exactly uh, what industries they're targeting. Um, from this perspective of, uh, I guess, the United States and other countries that might bring disputes about that, is that the United States might not be uh, subject to the meet most of those tariffs. It's going to be mostly developing countries. But uh, when we look at the trade of carbon intensive goods, most of them are not actually in the EU or in the US. Uh, it's between China and other countries. And how do you make sure uh, those countries are really paying those costs? And if there are tariffs on them, that they're just not subsidized and they don't feel any uh, costs in the first place. Uh, so does it meet real climate goals is the main question. And uh, are countries really going to cooperate on this to help it achieve those goals? Um, yeah, just very briefly, a lot of the same points I just made just now apply to this. It will be an extremely costly measure to administer uh, and collect um, and actually very distortive and ultimately profoundly regressive. Um, you know, the, the way that these kinds of measures, I mean, inevitably, trade measures, non-tariff barriers get presented by their proponents as being, um, you know, very worthy things to protect the environment or protect people's uh, health and protect consumers, but actually they're often disguised protectionism, and, and that absolutely screams out to me on this one, and it's protectionism against the poorest countries uh, who are trying to develop and industrialize. And, you know, arguably, it's, 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 it's actually quite a... Um, it, it, would have, it would have particular effects on certain um, ethnic and racial groups, essentially. So you could frame it if one wished to adopt the, the language of the social justice left, that it would actually be a racist measure. Yeah, it's racist. <laughs> and it's sneering, and it's snobbish. And it says that the, like the people who make things in factories in Bangladesh mm -hmm. are doing so in dirty conditions. They're doing something wrong. They're doing something wrong, yeah. And that's, that's, a, that's a bad attitude to have, isn't it? Um, because they've, cut, then they've termed it, and they've dipped it, and they've, ripped, they've dipped it in, a, in the thing that is the great social ill at the moment, which is carbon. But actually, carbon was one of the things that led to the greatest expansion in your living rights that you've ever had. And it's, the, and it's one of the greatest ideas. And they've nipped, the, they've put the idea of the, the free trade and they've then tarred it with this evil. And it's like, and that is, a, that is an ill. And that we've allowed that to happen is an ill. 
So, so, so stop it, basically. Call them out, use their own language against them, because it is a racist policy, um, and it shouldn't be, ha shouldn't be happening. And basically, right now, any tax you can cut, because we're at about 42%, isn't it, of GDP, and that's about the maximal. So that's about the maximal before you start eating economic growth for the next few generations. Um, and at that moment, therefore, any tax you can cut right now, and anyone you can convince to cut right now, that is, is, the, is doing a good. Um, and we've got a budget in two weeks, and like, my challenge to you guys is to stop the budget happening. But if you can't get that, at least get them to cut some taxes. Cancel the budget. Um, <laughs> uh, we've got time for a couple more questions. Um, gentlemen. Uh, there. It's Jack. It is um, from CP Group. Um, as you guess probably from my accent, I'm an Australian. Um, we have a number of disputes with our largest trading partner in the WTO. At the moment, I know this goes beyond the scope of the report, but since I have quite a few weeks of it, reform of the WTO um, in terms of resolving those disputes faster, or whether you think it uh, still has value as an organisation for um, reducing barriers to trade? So, uh, certainly the WTO still has value. Uh, I don't put a lot of hope in the WTO and uh, resolving a lot of disputes at the moment. And uh, there is uh, I think called JCPOA, the Alternative Dispute Resolution System, uh, where China says it will abide by that, and it has a lot of the same appellate judges that were at the WTO. Um, but as far as WTO reform, it's something that we'll have to wait probably to uh, next uh, administration, or at least another two years. Um, it's mostly politics between a few countries right now. Maybe one more question, and then we can wrap up um, not too long afterwards, or not. Okay. No. Was there one right here? No. no. Okay, all right, right. We're, we're, we're about time anyway, but um, just to wrap up, Philip, thank you so much for a detailed insight into a fantastic report. Look forward to 2022's already, so we can move up to third. Um, Andreas, thank you for the update on the digital services tax and, and the future challenges in, in the arena. Um, on a supranational level, Victoria taking our fourth place and giving us a bit of perspective on why we could do even better was very welcome. And Matt, thank you for your optimistic challenge for us to fight the good fight. So, um, and thank you all for joining us, um, either in person or on live stream. And thank you to American, uh, Americans for Tax Reform Foundation for um, choosing to join up with us to launch uh, today's report. Um, so if you could join me in thanking all of the panelists.